know that approximately half of all electricity used in Sweden comes from nuclear power, such as Oskarshamn nuclear power plant behind me. As you probably know, the nuclear waste is radioactive and dangerous if it's not handled correctly. This has caused different opinions on nuclear power. Many think it's good while others believe it to be bad. The problem is that regardless of how you feel about nuclear waste, we've used nuclear power in Sweden for over 35 years and that means that we already have a large amount of waste to take care of. At SKB, where I work, we don't take a stance on nuclear power. Instead, we have the job of developing a system to take care of the radioactive waste. How we deal with that problem, that's what this film is all about. This is what nuclear reactor fuel looks like. It's uranium dioxide in ceramic form. The small cylinders are called pellets, and before they've been used as fuel, they give off so little radiation that you can hold them in your hand. Inside the reactor, millions of pellets are gathered into long metal pipes. When water flows between them, the fission process begins, which generates heat that is used to produce electricity. But at the same time, many new substances are formed in the fuel, and some of these are highly radioactive and poisonous. Every year, about one-fifth of the fuel in the nuclear reactor is replaced. First, the fission process is stopped with the aid of control rods. The effect of the fuel assembly immediately drops from 30 million watts to 2 million watts per ton of fuel. And within a few days, the effect has dropped to 200,000 watts. The fuel assembly is then placed in a pool inside the nuclear power plant and stored for about a year. During this year, most of the radioactive substances dissipate. The radiation and heat effect falls to 20,000 watts, and that is a 90% drop. But even so, there's still a long way to go before the fuel is harmless. If we compare the radiation and heating effect of fuel removed from the reactor to a 22-story building, it would look something like this. After one year, the effect is reduced to one-tenth, which is equivalent to a house. After 30 years, the effect will have dropped another 90%, about the size of a doghouse. And after 1,000 years, it'll be as tall as a snail's house. But the fuel will still be dangerous for a long time to come. After the spent fuel has lain in the pool inside the reactor building for about a year, it's easier to handle. However, the radiation and heat are still so high that the waste has to be shielded and cooled. Therefore, it's moved to durable casks that securely protect against radiation before it's transported to club. Club is the central interim storage facility for spent nuclear fuel. All Sweden's spent nuclear fuel is brought here before going to a final long-term storage site. But how is it brought here? All nuclear power plants in Sweden are on the coast. So the best way to transport nuclear fuel from the power plants to club is by sea. But not just by any boat. It's done by MS Siegen. MS Siegen is custom designed to transport nuclear waste. She's built with a double hull which provides a 4 meter buffer to absorb the first impact in the event of a collision. It also makes the MS Siegen extremely buoyant compared to other ships. Vi har aldrig någon stress. Väljer vi att vänta ett dygn på att gå ut när det är storm så är det ingen som klagar. Det är ingen som står med tidtagare ur på kajen och förväntar sig att vi ska vara fram en viss tid. Men låt oss säga att sigen ändå skulle gå till botten så är det ingen direkt risk för allmänheten. För att det är inte sigen i sig som är skyddet mot strålning utan det är behållarna. Och sen är ju dessa behållare också väldigt väl fastsurrade i fartyget. Nere i lastrummet så finns det färdiga infästningar i däck där vi ställer ner behållarna och bultar fast dem i golvet så att säga.
When the MS Seagen arrives at the harbor at Klab, the transportation casks are unloaded and driven to Klab's receiving area. On arrival to Klab, the fuel is very hot and must therefore be cooled before the transport casks are opened. This is done by pumping water through them. After that, the casks are taken to a pool and docked from below with a pool above. Following that, the fuel element is transferred to a storage cassette. This ingenious construction prevents the outside of the transport casks from ever coming in contact with radioactive substances. Next, the storage cassette with the waste is sent down to the storage pools. The water in the pools circulates in a closed system that transfers the heat to the ocean through a heat exchanger. In this way, the hot fuel is continuously cooled. The fuel is always covered by three to eight meters of water. The water cools the fuel and it also shields from the radiation so that I can stand this close to the fuel without being exposed to radiation from it. Moreover, this facility lies 25 meters underground and can withstand an airplane crash as well as an earthquake. Of course, there are also backup systems for both water cooling and electricity should anything happen. But fact is that even if all of the backup systems failed, it wouldn't cause a catastrophe. The volume of water in the storage pools is so great that it would take a month for enough to evaporate and expose the fuel. And if for some reason the electricity couldn't be turned back on, then water could temporarily be added. The fuel has to be stored for at least 30 years in club so that the heat release diminishes. Thereafter, it can be stored without high temperatures occurring. Theoretically, the waste could be stored in club's ponds for hundreds of years, but then we'd be putting the burden of surveillance and ensuring that pumps and fans work onto future generations. So, we've been forced to find a solution that is permanent and that does not put any demands onto future generations. The solution is a final repository. A deep repository doesn't yet exist, but this is how it will work. The main part of the repository will lie 500 meters down in the Swedish bedrock. It's a very stable environment where any possible changes occur very slowly over time. Down there, canisters with waste will be individually placed in pre-bored holes in a tunnel system. As just one meter of rock is sufficient to stop the radiation emitted from the waste, Damage on animals and humans can only occur if radioactive particles are transported back up to the surface. Therefore, we've developed a method in which different barriers will prevent any possible radioactive leakage for over 100,000 years. First of all, the fuel, the tiny pellets, is as hard to dissolve in water as the rock itself. Matter is mainly releasable from the surface of the pellet. To isolate the fuel, it's stored in cast iron containers inside thick copper canisters. Copper is a noble metal that in the oxygen-free environment deep in the bedrock won't corrode. That means to rust. Where the copper canisters are placed in the rock, they'll be surrounded by bentonite clay. A kind of swelling clay that becomes very dense and prevents water from flowing around the canisters. Finally, the mountain itself is a barrier. If both the copper canister and the bentonite clay fails, then the mountain itself can retain or hinder most of the radioactive substances. Along with the final repository, an encapsulation plant will be needed. There, the fuel will be put into the copper canisters which are then welded shut and checked before transportation deep down into the repository for final storage. Right now, work is underway to find a safe place for the final repository. This investigation is expected to be completed in 2009 and will give the authorities and the government a basis for making a decision on the final repository. If all goes as planned, the first fuel canisters will be placed in the repository in 2018. 
By then we will have a complete system in operation for handling all radioactive waste. Beside the used fuel, nuclear power also creates other kinds of waste that has to be taken care of. For example, things that have become radioactive during operation of the nuclear power plant. Filters, replaced reactor parts, protective gloves or overalls that have been contaminated during maintenance work. This kind of waste is divided into low and intermediate level waste, and it has its own final repository at SFR. That's a facility near the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Uppland. It lies about one kilometer off the coast and 50 meters beneath the ocean floor. Here the waste will be isolated from people, animals and nature during the 500 years that it's dangerous. But before transportation, the waste needs to be packed. Some of the low-level waste, containing clothes and tools among other things, is burnt so it takes up less space. The ashes are then put into steel plate containers. Also, some non-combustible waste, such as scrap iron, is melted down so it takes up as little room as possible during final storage. The intermediate level waste, mainly consisting of filters, is mixed with asphalt or cement and cast in protective steel or cement containers. It can then be transported with MSC into SFR. The special thick-walled steel containers effectively contain the radiation and protect against mechanical damage. Simply put, you could say that SFR consists of four large rock vaults and a deep silo. Low-level waste can be handled directly with forklift trucks. Intermediate-level waste, on the other hand, is either handled by a remote-controlled overhead crane in large concrete compartments or in the large disposal shaft that's embedded in protective bentonite. Once the different compartments are filled, they're cast in cement. And finally, at SFR, some low- and intermediate-level waste from hospitals, research and industries are also taken care of. The same principle is true for SFR as for the future final repository. Different barriers will hinder the groundwater from transporting radioactive material back to the surface. Asphalt and concrete that encapsulates the waste, bentonite clay around the silo that swells and seals in contact with water, and finally the surrounding rock. In total, SKB will take care of enough waste to fill one-third of the Stockholm Globe Arena. Approximately 10% of it is high-level waste from spent nuclear fuel. 25% is low- and intermediate-level operational waste. Another 55% will be decommissioning waste from torn-down nuclear power plants. And the remaining 10% will be other long-lived waste from when the power plants club and the encapsulation plant are torn down. How this long-lived waste is to be stored will be decided at a later point in time. For us at SKB, it's all about developing a good method and finding a safe place for storage of the waste. This has been our challenge for more than 25 years now, and it can be said that we lead the way in research in this area. Experts from all over the world come here to learn more about the Swedish system. In the long run, this is all a question about responsibility. It's not reasonable to expect future generations to take care of our waste products. We use the electricity that the nuclear power plants produce, and so we have the obligation to take care of the waste products as well.